lot of times you would either be going out of bounds or you'd be slowing up and you'd still get hit. You give up and you get killed. Walter Payton becomes the all-time... So I realized that, well, you can't give up until the whistle is blown, until your last, you know, dying breath. talk about my dad every day either to myself or to somebody else every day he was my superhero this is walter payton beyond the glory Nobody allowed themselves to think that the worst would happen to Walter Payton. Sweep to the right side, he gets a block from Remy Sorry, spins back inside, ripped by one man, still on his feet, struggles away at the 20, still battling, breaks away at the 15, the 10, the 5, and down to the 4-yard line. Sensational run by Walter Payton. Hi, Connie. I just want you to know that we are all huge fans of Walter. Hello, Hello Connie. My name is Ed. Your husband, Walter, was my childhood hero, and he still Thank is today. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to leave you a few memories of man. First of all, I would like I grew to up watching your husband amaze everyone. I cried like a baby when I heard about his death. I would like to say what a tremendous sorrow I felt when Walter passed. God must have needed an angel. Long live 34. You just feel. I know he should be here. I know that he is here somewhere. There are no shortcuts to success. You gotta sweat to get it. You gotta think. He was a tough hand to be dealt, but he made the best of it. Uh, it may have been tougher for my mother than, than anybody else, because that's her baby. You know, like anything that I do, I feel that I owe to my mother and father because they... You want to remember, but when it come on your mind, you try to block it out. I mean, because it just brings it back so real. To the people that really care about me, Everybody is a role model. <laughs> you get out there every Sunday and you give all you have, then that's all you can do. There it goes. Touchdown! I want to play. But first, you know, I have to prepare for life. And football is just one part of it. wanting a girl when Eddie was born. And about six months later, I was pregnant with Pam. After Pam was born, and my neighbor always uh, teased me. She said, well, what you want this time? And I said, well, I don't care what he be. He can be anything, you know. And she always said, he's just about that. He's just about what you said, anything. My dad was born July 25th, 1954, southern Mississippi, along the Pearl River, in a little small town called Columbia. 
It's typical uh, small town South Mississippi. I wouldn't have wanted to grow up anywhere other than Columbia. Just about everybody knows everybody, black and white. My mother and father both worked at the same place. They worked at a parachute manufacturing company in Columbia, at one time the largest in the country. That was considered a good job back in the day. I don't know what the pay was, but it was a good job. Beats pick and cut. My dad was the enforcer in our family. He didn't say anything. My mother did all the talking, uh, all of the directions. Yeah, he, did, he didn't have much to say. But when he said something, he meant it, you know. He <laughs> my grandpa Pete and my grandma Eileen, they were hard workers. They passed it on to their kids. I made a work around the house. I'd, we'd haul, we hauled dirt in there. My husband had dirt haul in there, and they'd have to spread it. We didn't have anything other than a mover but a wheelbarrow. And my mother allegedly wanted to level out her front yard. Uh, they'd dump it. One of us would load it. The other one of us would push it. Uh, we didn't know at the time, and we appreciate it now. It, one, it kept us out of trouble and got us in great shape. My Uncle Eddie was the first football star in our family. He was a running back at Jefferson High School. My dad, he didn't even play football at first. Walter was in the band. He was a little drummer boy. I believe the reason he didn't play was because he didn't want to compete with Eddie. That, that's my belief now. He just would never would play with Eddie that much, you know, not competitive. He wasn't like Eddie. Eddie was always trying and <laughs> competing, but Walter never would. But he would observe it, and then when he tried it, he, he could do it. At the time, I think he felt that he'd get a better opportunity to play and show what he could do if he waited. I did talk to him. And uh, when Eddie graduated, Walter started. January 14th, the state's largest school district, the Jackson Municipal District, was ordered by the U.S. Supreme Court to implement total desegregation. We played that junior year, and of course, integration came. This plan required that Jackson Public Schools be further desegregated in Jackson Public Schools. Jefferson was an all-black school. Columbia High was an all-white school. Walter's class was the first class uh, to integrate uh, Columbia had that during that period. If they bring to this effort the zeal that they have brought to segregation in the past, the job can be done quite readily. It was in January of 1970, uh, right in the middle of the year. Nobody knew what to expect that fall. Everybody was on edge, worrying about fights and what have you, you know. To make everybody see, if not, if not the state of Mississippi, but Washington, D.C., we will not be satisfied that justice is done. We had three or four guys showed up and stood out there on the corner with signs. They weren't even going to Columbia High School, and they were protesting. We won seven straight games that year. To me, that was the end of integration. That's when they all fell in love with Walter. And all, you know, it was Walter, 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 like a, a father of a house.
when a father leaves the home. There's something that goes with him that no one can replace. If there's angels living on Earth, my mom got to be one of them. Hi, how are you? To be behind somebody who's a superstar, and you have to be special. Our first game and so just feel so that's exciting you know this nice beautiful new stadium <laughs> honorary captain that's my title tonight something just told me to look over and I looked over it and she was sitting in a spot where Walter sit all the time on the south end of the bench where the defense sits. It was nice seeing her, you know, and, uh, and getting that little irky feeling. Thank you. It's nice to, you know, have people come up in to share those stories and keep his memory going. been good for me too it's for us just really getting through it and and you know the healing process we had a lot of great football players have come through the bears organization over the years but none they all pale in comparison to him my dad kind of laid the foundation for guys coming out of small schools being able to make it big in the nfl he had decided to go to kansas uh, he stopped in Jackson on his way to Kansas to watch his practice. At the end of practice, he came up to the room. We sit down and talk, and he said, you know, I'm not real sure I want to go to Kansas. So we just put your foot lock in here, and we'll work it out. The rest is history. Jackson State University. That's where my dad shined. But most importantly, that's where he met my mom. His college coach was dating my aunt, and um, he wanted me to come to Jackson and meet this guy that, I mean, who's like a son to him, and he had really talked Walter up. Bob Hill is a legend. He uh, was protective of him. Uh, he wanted to make sure he didn't get away. I don't know if he had talked me up to Walter, but I know he really talked Walter up. So I think it was that, that part was more exciting. But actually, the date was very boring. He knew Walter needed uh, stability as a college student, and uh, he thought that having a girl would happen. Bob Hill just insisted that I needed to come to Jackson State so I could keep an eye on Walter. You know, he's like, he needs you, he needs you. And I'm thinking, goodness gracious, you know, he hasn't told me that he needs me there. <laughs> I ended up trying out for uh, this dance group. We were called the uh, J-Sets. You have to meet a pretty strict criteria to be a part of that unit. I was hated by every girl, I think, on that campus. Because it was like, she's new here. No one knows her. And she gets, like, the premier athlete at Jackson State. You know, who is this girl? They were just jealous. So my dad was like Superman. In four years, he scored more touchdowns than anyone ever scored in college football. But he wanted more. I remember we were watching, we were sitting in our room watching the Ohio State game. Archie Griffin, and at the time, Archie was, they were hyping him for the Heisman Trophy, and he was about to win. He was watching the game. He said, I'm mad. Jumped up, sat up on his bed, on the corner of his bed, and just grinding his teeth. And he was saying, I'm better than him, 10 times better than him. We wondered if they would give it to a guy from a predominantly black school versus some of the largest schools. That night, Walter just, he had one of the, one of the greatest games of his career. Uh, and he, and it, all, it all started sitting there watching Archie Griffin. 
when you see like a Jackson State and you see those games aren't on TV. But then my dad, when he was on you know, the third pick in the draft, so someone must have been watching him. Well, we saw a lot of film on him. The admiration and the respect that we've had for Walter on film was unbelievable. He could go all the way at the 30, 20, 15, 10. Touchdown. I think, yeah, you know, we all watched the film. We got ready for the draft that year. When Walter came out, I remember all the offensive coaches wanted to take Walter. All the defensive coaches wanted to take uh, Randy White. He was almost a cowboy, but the Bears drafted him. A Mississippi lawyer named Bud Holmes negotiated his first contract and every contract after that. Let me kind of give you an insight into Walter. Mississippi was in the beginning of integration and total integration, and there was a little school there in Petal, Mississippi, that had just integrated. And they were having a senior party, and they'd asked me to get them a speaker. This is before Walter had ever been drafted or anything. And I said, well, as a kid, he broke every kind of record in the world, NCAA and scoring, Jack the State, that uh, I'd get him. Well, I'd be fine, bring him home. Well, here's a scene. Here's an all-white kid uh, around a big old bonfire. Here are all these pickup trucks from Sierra with Rebel flag and shotguns in them. Walter gets up and starts talking to him. These kids don't say a word. Within a matter of about three minutes, Walter Payton had very little kids spellbound. They all wanted to talk. They all wanted his autograph. And Walter never flinched. And I sat there and I knew then, I said, this kid is something special. I don't see any colors. I just see people. That's what my mom and dad taught me a long time ago. The biggest thing that I've taken from him from being a kid was to let things just develop, you know? You, you never know what's gonna happen, but just to live your life one day at a time. Life is so short, you never promise the next day. So just to be able to embrace all the people that are around you all the time and cherish that. Bear football has always meant a certain thing to me. It was Hallis football. That's what I came into the league with. Uh, you play physical, you play hard, you play to the last play. You get after people. We had completely different running styles. I felt that I could beat one man 100% of the time, two men 75% of the time, so I had some good moves. Walter, you know, he had moves, but he could run you over also. Gail was poetry in motion. Walter was relentless. My career was very, very short. I played 68 ball games in my career. That's only about four and a half years playing time. Walter played 13 years. 13 years in the National Football League and misses one game. One game. Cold weather in Chicago and Green Bay and Minnesota and, you know, misses one ball game. Then all of a sudden, uh, he's gone. Chicago is the only home I've ever known. My dad came here in 1975. All that Bears tradition was just ancient history back then. Gee whiz, he ended up with the worst team out of everybody. And not only is he playing in this real cold weather, they can't win a football game. It's awful. I said to Walter, suppose you'd gone to Miami where you had grease and you'd been enjoying doing nothing but blocking. I said, that's where you want to be? Or would you rather be where they're going to feed you the ball 20, 30 times? What did Martin Luther King say? Give me an opportunity, not a handout. 
you have the opportunity. When you saw Walter play, you couldn't tell whether they were winning or losing. Walter took the, the mailman perspective. You know, neither rain, nor sleep, nor dark of night stopped the mailman from his appointed round. You know, neither lack of a passing game, lack of an offensive line, bad weather will stop me from performing for Joe Q. Public, who takes two weeks' pay, takes all of his family, buys a ticket in the nosebleed, and sits up there to watch Walter Payton perform. The thing of it is, Walter always produced. He's always got over 100 yards rushing. Uh, he's doing everything he can. And, and of course, the, the, the people in media knew that he couldn't do it by himself. I mean, he was leading the league in rushing. The Bears were losing, and he, he didn't say a word. People of Chicago recognized how genuine he was, and they adopted him. I mean, the people of Chicago now think he's from Chicago, not Mississippi. You know, when Walter played, it was his town. In Chicago, he got his nickname, Sweetness. In 1979, he and my Uncle Eddie were called home to Mississippi. All we had was what people said and the facts to deal with. And the facts were that my father was arrested for drunken driving when he was not drunk. He was, had the symptoms of uh, someone who had been drinking because of uh, the bleeding in his brain. A couple of years ago, I'd gotten to be friends with a guy who was the jailer on duty that night. Uh, and he told me the way he was acting, they just all assumed he was intoxicated. They carried him and uh, put him in jail. And uh, that's where he died. I think when his father passed is when I, I really sensed that he wished his father would have come to more games. Because I think we all just take it for granted. And he might have felt it, I'm sure he did. But it wasn't until his father actually passed that he finally actually verbally said, you know, um, you know, a lot of this was for my dad and I wish he could have been here to enjoy it. And the thing that really stays with me is that uh, I know my father would be very proud of my son. He never got a chance to see him. But my son is so much like him. You know, I see my father in him. I never met my grandfather. I don't even remember all that much about my father's career. If I remember one thing... Peyton needs six yards to tie Jim Brown's all-time mark today. I mean, he broke Jim Brown's record. Peyton. You know, to break a record or set a record like that, the first thing that has to happen, besides being a great football player, you have to be durable. You can't, you can't be injured. This guy was as solid as a rock. He was like a, the rock at Gibraltar. He was always fit, and he was able to stay on the football field. That's the biggest key right there. The motivating drive for me has been for the athletes that have tried, but yet and still have failed, and also the athletes that, uh, that didn't get an opportunity to like the Overstreets and the Delaney's and the Brian Piccolo's. The thing I remember the most was leaving the stadium and the Lamborghini that he got. I was like, this is like the coolest thing ever. There was a crowd of people trying to get to him, but the kind of man he was, he was trying to get out of there. And that was the first thing that like he said as soon as we hit it was, let's go see how fast it can go. 
And that was exciting in itself, but I don't know if we, any of us anticipated the following year. We are the Bears, shuffling crew, shuffling on down, doing it for you. We're so bad, we know we're good, blowing your mind like we knew we would. You just knew that they were unbeatable, that they were unstoppable something so magnetic about these guys, you know. I mean, you just felt it. Walter was there 10 years before they got all the pieces together. He wanted it so bad that he could taste it. Number 34, Walter. And it just made us work that much harder to get in there. championship team was it was everybody's ultimate goal he was definitely the main point of, of our football team for us getting there he had to perform and he did but at the same time you wait all these years to get here and you don't even score the touchdown you have to know that he is the number one priority of that patriot defense they're chanting walter walter when it came to me and i really thought about it i really thought about it you know, how really stupid I was and, 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 and not getting the ball to him or making sure he got the ball in that situation. You know, these are things you can't change. You can't turn back the clock. It would have been nice for me to score a touchdown, but I, I don't want anybody to give me anything. If Scoring a touchdown in the Super Bowl was the final gem within my career that would make my career, Then my career wasn't anything before that. I don't remember the going over the, in the end zones. I don't remember running over people. I remember the person. The person was, uh, is going to live a lot longer than the records. They'll never be a star like number 34. last playoff game. Walter was sitting on the sideline for a while, uh, alone. I went over, you know, to him and said, well, it, you know, that's what uh, everybody does. You always got new worlds to conquer, Walter. What do you do? That's the biggest thing he struggled with from the beginning was, what do I do now? I guess the only thing I can say now is thanks for being there. The more successful you are as a professional athlete, the more difficult it becomes to find something that will give you the same gratification. He jumped into racing cars, things that I generated the same type of excitement. When I was a kid, I had to grow up too fast. So now that I'm an adult, I'm, I'm going to live the kid life that I never had a chance to do. I can't remember exactly how old I was, but I was with him at this race, and uh, he was on his warm-up lap. And it, it came across the radio that someone had been in an accident. When I saw him, he was laying on a stretcher. He grabbed my hand and he's just like, I'm okay, I'm gonna be okay, don't worry. And me, I'm crying, just sobbing, and I think I made him cry a little bit too to see the hurt in my eyes and how scared I was. To get out with the injuries that he had, 
you know, uh, someone was watching over him. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Walter Payton. Last November, the 35-year-old Payton came one step closer to achieving his goal. His dream, I mean, he came really, really close to realizing that dream was to become the first black owner in the National Football League. Before the Rams moved to St. Louis, my father worked to get an expansion team there. But in the end, the NFL chose Jacksonville and Carolina. When it didn't happen, I mean, he, he felt it. I think that eventually, Walter would have made it as an owner. It was just a matter of time, and uh, just that time ran out. Time ran out. Presenting Walter Payton for induction is Walter's 12-year-old son. Welcome, Jarrett Payton. I didn't want to do it from the beginning. I was scared. My dad had played football for 13 years, only missing one game and breaking all running back records. On behalf of your friends and your fans, I say congratulations too. Everything that my dad always taught me was getting me up to that point. I want to stand up here and say that Jared, Brittany, and your mom, you guys will never have to worry about anything in your life, no matter what the situation or how it ends. I had to grow up faster than most kids had to grow up. I had to do things that I didn't want to do, but I had to do them because my dad wanted me to experience life. Because of my wanting to give to so many other people, sometimes you, you tend to neglect the people that you truly love the most. It was in the fall of 98. He had started losing weight, but then by this time, it was really noticeable. I think my brother and I both could sense that something was wrong. My father was diagnosed with primary sclerosing cholangitis, a rare disease of the liver. Basically, he needed a transplant. We just knew that eventually he, he would get his liver and that, you know, everything would be okay. All this happened when I started my football career. Jared had decided to go to Miami. And when I saw Walter, I said, hey, wait a minute. This is a bad picture here. This is a bad angle. This can't be Walter. You can play running back or a wide receiver or defensive back. It doesn't matter. A couple of the sports anchors, uh, I think they misunderstood. They weren't serious about it in the beginning, and I think uh, People kind of went into shock. He realized, you know, as much as I want to keep this to myself, you know, I guess I do owe it to people out there. And it's really nothing to hide. He's getting ready for the Walter Payton press conference. Uh, Dr. Legatude is going to be with him. Being around my dad, you know, you always going to laugh, and people are going to be talking, laughing. Nobody was saying anything at all. It was silent. What do I weigh now? You want to pick me up? But he still was talking. He still had his gang face on, making sure that everybody around was OK. To the people that really care about me, to the, to the people that really care about me, just continue to pray. And for those we're going to say what they want to say. May God be with you also. Let me tell you what I thought, because I remember this very clearly. I said, this is a fight he'll win. He will win this fight if he gets the transplant. I went by his home, and uh, he began to explain. And I, I think that was the beginning you know, the doctors may have found something else. Um, I don't really know. They think they, it may be cancer. He never gave in. He never gave up. 
I mean, he fought to the very end. To the very end, when I saw him, he was laughing. And he had that smile on his face, just never why me. Doctors finally just came and said, you know, there's nothing else we can do. I don't know, I think it might have been, I don't know, maybe if you do, it's just something after we brought him home that he finally passed. Life is short. It's oh so sweet. There are a lot of people that we meet in as we walk through these shallow halls. Everyone that I've met in my life, I have gained something from them. Everybody is a role model. Never die easy for anything, no matter what it is. That just explains his life. You combined the gifts of life, love, joy, movement, and grace. He was in many ways what we don't expect a superstar to be. Accessible, genuine, down to earth. I got a little girl, she's four years old. 10 years from now, when she asked me about the Chicago Bears, the first thing I tell her about is Walter Payton. I feel him so much every day. I don't think of him as gone. I mean, I really don't. I was downtown in the city one night. This man, about 25, he came up to me and had like tears in his eyes. And he took off his shirt and he had a big 34 tattooed on his back, like in bear's colors. And he looked at me, he just said, thank you. And he walked away. You lose sight sometimes when they're gone, you know, how they affect the people's lives, you know, and you that's why you wish they were still here. He gave people a lot of joy. People had real personal encounters with him, and, and everybody's story is their own personal, you know, Walter Payton story. Well, I'm going to read a letter that was sent to Connie after Walter passed away, and it's simply this. Hello, Connie, my name is Ed. Your husband, Walter, was my childhood hero, and he still is today. Myself and the rest of the world lost someone special. I would like to say what a tremendous sorrow I felt when Walter passed. We love you, we respect you as a man, we admire you as a player, and we care about you. The amount of letters that came in and the amount of cards that were sent, it was crazy. And it was nice to go back and read them and laugh at some of them and cry at some of them and see that, you know, as much pain as I'm going through, there's other people out there that are hurting just as much. In the months after my father passed, we set up the Walter Payton Cancer Fund. The other thing about my mom is that people say, oh, she couldn't do it. She's going to fall apart. The way my family is, the way our mentality is, is we never give up. I went to Congress and I testified on why I thought integrative medicines were good and why people should not have to snatch their kids and go to Mexico and other countries for medicines that we want to allow here because for whatever reasons we don't allow them, when there are really other ways out there to treat cancer other than radiation and chemo. Those are fine, but there are other methods and there are other ways and we should be open to those other treatments. Hopefully with the research and the monies that you know we raise, we will find a cure. Or if not, at least hopefully make people's lives better while they're here. My sister Brittany also helped set up an organization called Youth for Life. 
to educate young people about organ donation. You know, high school age, you're 16, you're starting to get your license, and just making that decision to check the back of your license saying that you want to be an organ donor can save so many lives. I was born into this. Since I've been little, no matter what happens, I'm always going to be compared to him. No matter what I do, if that's if I'm a chef, if I play soccer, people are going to always compare me to him playing football all the time. It's like a shark, a baby shark. When he comes out, he comes out in the water and nobody teaches him how to swim. Jared Payton, the son of a great water Payton. I think Walter wanted Jared to play the game at the highest level. Pro football and college football is a Grand Canyon wide, the gap. Somebody will pick him up and give him an opportunity to play, no question about it. But uh, uh, he's going to have to work very, very hard to make a, a pro football team. Looking to turn to the outside, it does outrun Hugh Green to the five. Some people can't play on Sunday, but I think he got the opportunity to play on Sunday. Definitely, you know, come from the right source, so. He may never be what his father was, but so what? His father would be so, so, so proud, just like Connie is of him right now, just like Brittany is, uh, of what he's accomplished. Whatever happens next, I'm not going to worry about it. I know we're gonna be all right. My dad made sure of that.